AI run the government? So this question actually came from one of my Patreon supporters. So thank you, Spectral Valkyrie, for this question. Uh, but basically the idea was, okay, rather than just look at the way things are and look at incremental changes from where we're at to a potential future, what if we just take a first principles look at could the AI run the government? What would that look like? So before we dive in, I just wanted to let you know this video is a little bit longer and it's uh, broken down into three distinct parts. So the first part is we will talk about what is the purpose of government in general uh, and that will kind of set the stage because there is quite a bit of debate over what the role of government is or should be, and it's mostly in terms of degrees. Uh, so anyways, we'll get into that in just a moment. Then in the, in the middle part, we will talk about what would an AI government actually look like? How is that actually going to function? How would it run? And then finally, in the last part of the video, I will make some actual real predictions based on things that I know are happening today and things that are in the works. And so we'll see kind of what what the actual progress should look like. So if any one of these parts doesn't resonate with you, feel free to skip ahead. Um, but yeah, let's get right into it. So the first thing that we need to say is, okay, well, what is, uh, objectively speaking, what is the outcome? What is the function that government provides? And right now, there are kind of five key pillars that government provides. And there's there, the biggest one that's missing is military. Um, but what I will say is that the military can operate as a separate entity from government. And in fact, in many, uh, in many institutions, it kind of does. It's technically an extension of the executive branch, but it is also supposed to have um, its own thing. So that is deliberately and distinctly missing. So we're looking more at domestic government. So domestic government uh, focuses on these five key principles. So first is resource management. Uh, uh, regulating public goods and natural resources for sustainability, that sort of thing. So land use, um, waterways, air, that sort of stuff. Forests, you know, uh, drilling rights. Uh, the second thing is economic management. So this is fiscal and monetary policy. So this has to do with central banks uh, regulating the stock market, that sort of stuff. Uh, you know, again, you're familiar with all these because we argue about it every few years here in America uh, based on who we want to elect. The third pillar is uh, mediation of relationships. So this is facilitating and mediating the relationships between citizens, nations, organizations, so on and so forth. And so there's a few ways that these regulations happen or that this, this mediation happens. So first is like corporate law. So ensuring that, you know, companies abide by safety regulations, that sort of thing. There's also the courts. So like if you have a dispute with someone else, there's criminal court, there's civil court, uh, that sort of thing. There's the Supreme Court. So the court system is, is part of this relationship mediation. It's, it's there to broker or referee relationships between various uh, stakeholders in the government, namely citizens, businesses, and then other nations. So the diplomatic corps, the, the State Department, as we call it in America, um, that is part of the relationship mediation. So the government manages our relationship with, say, Britain or France or China on our behalf. The fourth thing is that um, they guarantee and protect and enforce rights. And so there's uh, this is a, a recent term, so I've been plugging it a lot, that I learned um, positive rights versus negative rights. So uh, a positive right is something that you're entitled to, and a negative right is something that you are free from. And so, for instance, our, our Constitution um, guarantees that you are entitled to a right to free speech. You are entitled to a jury by your peers. You are entitled to um, certain other things, uh, plenty of other things. Um, but then you're also free from tyranny, you know, free, to, free from oppression and those sorts of things. Um, and so there's two different kinds of rights. And, of course, there, it's, as I mentioned earlier, um, it is also a matter of degree because Many of your rights are relatively simple, but then we're, there's also debate over more complex or comprehensive rights. And then finally, social organization. And so this is one of the most controversial ones, um, especially if you look at the news right now. Uh, the state of Texas is all up in arms about abortion rights. So again, talking about social organization, uh, by and large, Western liberal democracies have decided not to, to legislate morality. Um, and you can see this by virtue of contrast when you look at the fact that, like, um, there is some TikTok celebrity who got arrested, I think, in Saudi Arabia for adultery. 
Like, we don't do that in the West anymore. We don't say like, oh, well, this woman, you know, had sex with someone that she wasn't supposed to. So therefore, we're going to put her in morality jail. Right. There was huge uh, protests that broke out in Iran because a woman was beaten by the morality police. And so by and large, Western democracies, the the role of legislating uh, morality and social structure is contracting. However, government does still play a role in this. And so what I mean by that is, um, you know, what it, what are legally recognized marriages? What are the family structures that are legally recognized? And so right now, uh, Western liberal democracies have have kind of centered around the nuclear family or the the smallest family unit, which is the marriage between a husband and a wife. Whereas in the past, there were, you know, usually it was, uh, you know, tribal communities or extended families where you'd have a matriarch or a patriarch who kind of managed the whole family. And that was the legal unit. Uh, and there are still plenty of countries out there where um, if not in law, then at least in practice, that is how things are run. And so the government does have a role in supporting that social organization. Then there's also other aspects of it, such as the relationship between the government and the fourth estate, which is journalism, um, or or the church as well. So those are kind of the five main pillars of government. Like I said, there are plenty of other things from that list that are missing. That is on purpose, but these are kind of the five pillars that I want to look at for this video. So also... Uh, as I as I promised, a lot of this is controversial, and this goes back to even the founding of modern democracy, where Socrates himself questioned the um, the efficiency and wisdom of democracy. So some of his uh, critiques were, and of course, this is back in the days of Athens before representative democracy. So most of what he was complaining about was tyranny of the majority. Also, I'm really toasty, so I'm going to switch clothes. Ooh, okay, properly dressed now. But yeah, so Socrates was concerned about tyranny of the majority, um, and there's also the what we would today call like you know the, the kind of the difference between inclusive democracy where everyone gets a say versus uh, expertise, and this is one of the chief tensions, um, particularly in America, but also in other nations, because communism, like capital C communism. Um, said, oh, well, the citizens shouldn't have a vote because they're all dumb. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're just going to hand the reins to the quote unquote experts. And then the experts without any checks and balances are going to get to make decisions. And in Soviet Russia, that led to mass famines because the so-called experts mismanaged farms, mismanaged the economy and that sort of thing. And that, by the way, still goes on today. There are, um, I was watching a documentary about how um, there there are places in China that you still can't grow uh, food because of decades of communist mismanagement. On the other hand, uh, your average citizen is also not necessarily qualified to make decisions. So you, you're kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. Now, what I wanted to include this slide for, for was to say that there are flaws with democracy. I would say that there are more egregious flaws, particularly with every way that communism has been implemented. And so I am not a communist. I'm not a socialist, even though some of you accuse me of that. I also have people say that I'm a neoconservative. So make up your minds. <laughs> I consider myself a pragmatic progressive. But anyways, that's a conversation for another uh, another topic. Um, so let's move, let's move on. But I just wanted to address the elephant in the room and say that, yes, democracy is does have some fundamental flaws going back to the founding of the thing. The other uh, component of uh, that makes government hard is just intrinsic human flaws. And so one example is charismatic leaders. Um, so charismatic manipulators are able to use demagoguery and other things to, um, you know, kind of get in and, and you know, wreck things. Uh, power seeking behavior, uh, profit motivation, plain old ignorance. And so basically this all uh, speaks to the reason that government is structured as the way that it is. Because the framers of uh, modern Western liberal democracies basically said, okay, well, uh, they didn't have the word for it, but they noticed that, you know, uh, a non-trivial chunk of the population is just crazy. Um, whether they're narcissistic, whether they are um, sociopaths, whether they are just uh, completely saturated with greed, um, so they said, okay, well, we have to know that some people are going to be power seeking. We have to know that some people are going to be manipulative and so on and so forth. And so that's part of the reason that the government is structured the way that it is so that you have checks and balances so that you have these relief mechanisms that allow you to, um, you know, change up leadership on a regular basis. 
which in theory should prevent um, any particular uh, group or person from accumulating and holding on to too much power. So far, so good, but there are some people who very deliberately and explicitly want to upset that balance um, because what happens is when you allow for the leadership um, at all levels to change up on a regular basis and you have this kind of a, as a mechanistic system, um, you prevent that accumulation of power, but also you it's it becomes easier to spot people who are accumulating power. Now, of course, here in America, we have a problem of gerontocracy where we have people literally serving until their 80s and 90s and in recent cases dying in office even though they are not legally competent to take care of themselves. So if someone is not legally competent to take care of themselves, they are certainly not legally competent to run the, the, the nation. But of course, the, uh, the American system was framed before people were living long enough to have dementia. So <laughs> yeah, we, we got some work to do. So that leads us to uh, representative democracy. So basically, the way that it generally runs today is that we have a division of power. We have a three-branch system. So that's legislative, judicial, and executive branch. Um, the, the, the judicial branch is obviously like one of the weaker ones, um, except for the Supreme Court, which does kind of set a lot of the tone. Um, we use elected officials. So the elected officials then, you know, represent our willpower and they appoint uh, experts. Um, and then some of the, sometimes we do vote on experts. Sometimes we don't. Some officials, some offices are appointed by the electorate. Some aren't. Um, but this is all part of the ongoing negotiation. And part of the reason that it's so messy is because we're constantly making little adjustments to the whole structure, um, which is good because, uh, you know, you look at revolutions of the past and one of the key thing, one of the key reasons why civil wars have happened in the past is because, uh, and not even in the distant past, in the recent past, is because the government is too rigid or too inflexible and does not respond to the will of the people and the changing times. And so the, the key thing is peaceful transitions. Um, it's not just a matter of representing the will of the people, because if you wanted to create a government that was purely of the people, for the people, by the people, it would look different from representative democracy. But really what, 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 the, uh, what the framers, particularly of the, of the American system, wanted to achieve was peaceful transition of power. Uh, because when you had monarchy, you'd have wars of succession. Um, when you had the, you know, basically most of Europe being run by a single royal family and all their cousins and second cousins and fifth cousins, um, you could still end up with major problems. Uh, see World War One and World War Two. Um, now, obviously, uh, America was founded before that, but there was oh man, you listen to history like Europe was just one constant set of wars for like five hundred years. Um, and then, as I already mentioned, incremental changes. Part part of the goal of government is to allow for incremental changes um, that is not necessarily steered uh, exclusively by a controlling elite but that the will of the people can make incremental changes to the government itself, even the founding document, um, such as, in our case, a constitutional democracy. And so the idea is that this is a gigantic system that is meant to uh, allow change, but also resist change, because you don't want the pendulum to swing too wildly. You don't want to oscillate by correcting and then overcorrecting. And so these are all the, all the things that go into the purpose of government. Why is it here? Why does it work the way that it does? So this stands in stark contrast to single party systems, such as what we see in China and Russia, which they are technically democracies because they, they run quote unquote elections. Um, but most of the elections are fixed. And I think that it's not a controversial thing to say that they are not actually true democracies or they are what I would call a kind of a pseudo democracy where it's got some of the dressings, some of the trappings. But you can, when you consider that both Putin and Xi Jinping were able to, to manipulate the system so that they were lifelong appointees, they basically made themselves kings. Um, so some of the characteristics that you see in single party systems are you get a monolithic structure. Um, that's by definition, the CCP is China. China is the CCP. There isn't really any alternative. Um, while there are technically other, you know, people that run against Putin, they usually fall out of windows or end up getting poisoned. So that's not necessarily a viable strategy there. Um, part of the way that these regimes maintain control is they become more authoritarian over time. Um, and so that leads to things like information control. Both Russia and China have state-run media. Um, so basically, if you see a lack of state-run media, that is usually a sign of a healthier democracy, which we'll talk about in just a second. 
Um, they do allow liberalization. So this is one of the this is one of the things that kind of gave us hope after the collapse of the Soviet Union and after China's great leap forward um, was that they eventually did allow for um, some liberalization of the economy because they wanted the profits, but they didn't liberalize um, in terms of civil liberties, in terms of voting rights and and government reforms. Um, and there are also uh, pretty interesting cultural and historical roots um, as uh, that kind of explain why this happens. Now, you could look at uh, places like Japan and Germany, which did, uh, granted, at the barrel, at the <laughs> because guns were pointed at them after World War II, they were able to liberalize um, uh, very effectively. Now, Jap- uh, Japan still has the imperial family, but they're mostly just token, right? You know, the Japanese parliament runs the country. Uh, Germany got a, did away with everything, and now they are, you know, fully fully liberalized democracy. And so, the argument that um, that single party systems inevitably emerge in some of these nations for historical and cultural reasons doesn't necessarily stand up to scrutiny, particularly when you look at the history of Japan. Um, but they also had to lose a, a major war in order to have the, that uh, new democracy forced on them. And of course, that set the uh, the tone for the rest of the 20th century and 21st century, where the Western allies basically enforce and export democracy um, onto other nations, whether or not they want it, which, of course, that's what Putin and Xi Jinping are pushing back against now. Um, actually, more explicitly, it's very interesting where they just basically have flatly said, like, we don't want your Western values. Now, do they re- do do they reflect the will of the people? Doesn't sound like it. I've interviewed some people from um, from other places, not Russia or China, but I interviewed some people from Syria, and the the idea is that the more that they learn about Western democracy, the more that they want it, which is the reason that people like uh, Putin and Xi Jinping need to resist information and need to poison their people against the idea of voting and and power. But that's uh, that's why there is still ongoing conflict in Syria is because uh, people know they've seen greener pastures and they want it and they're going to keep fighting for it. Uh, the fighting has tamped down, but Syria is deeply fragmented right now. Um, so anyways, uh, that is the, by virtue of contrast, looking at a single party system or failed democracies, um, which there are some people that explicitly want to turn America into a single party system. And to all of you, I say, stop. And then finally, there is the the nightmarish central management or totalitarian regimes. Um, this is what you see in terms of fascism or old school communism, where there wasn't any elections whatsoever, uh, farcical or otherwise. North Korea is is the current kind of prime example of the the, the quote unquote uh, hermit kingdom, where it is top down authoritarian control, um, and they regulate everything. Um, <laughs> Apparently, in North Korea, they even regulate how much grieving you're supposed to do for the former dead leaders. Um, so that's not just a legislating morality. They're, they're, they're controlling emotions. And apparently, people have been sent, sent to like re-education camps for not grieving enough in public on their days of remembrance or whatever. Um, these kinds of things, they, they're necessarily surveillance states. Um, extreme conformity is required, and then and then any breach of conformity is deeply and severely punished. Democracy is noisy. This is one of the things that I think a lot of people don't understand, which is why I'm going through all this, is because all the vitriol, all the vicious debates about you know Trump versus Biden, or you know left versus right, or you know whoever. Um, democracy is is noisy by design. Um, when you look at a, at a at a nation that you know say oh we're we're perfectly aligned because they quash debate, you're not allowed to criticize Putin. You're not allowed to criticize uh, Xi Jinping. You're not allowed to criticize the um, the you know, Kim Jong Un. Um, so because of that, those nations they appear more orderly. They appear quieter. They appear to be uh, more in lockstep. However. In America and India and Britain and all these other places, where you have really vicious debates, you have mudslinging, you have you have muckraking, you have all kinds of things, um, and that is by design. And so, when you understand that that the ability to speak up, that you know, if you really don't like something in the West, you can start a YouTube channel or a TikTok channel and and say, you know, the president's an idiot, and like I have zero fear of that. Whereas, like, could you do that in China? In Russia, in North Korea, 
No. And of course, those are just some of the most extreme examples. There are plenty of other oppressive regimes around the world. And so because of that, because debating is encouraged, because dissent is tolerated, because we can air our grievances, this uh, allows for a level of transparency. But the flip side of that is that people don't get along all all the time. The fact of the matter is, is that, you know, you can say things that people disagree with and then you can get into internet debates or, you know, choose your favorite talking head, which now I have joined the League of Talking Heads. So, yeah, whatever. Um, but these are all features. This is a feature, not a bug. That is the key thing is that if democracy is noisy, that is a sign of a healthy democracy. Now, you can also end up in situations where people kind of naturally agree um, and so this is, this is uh, you know, there was, what was it called? The era of good feelings, um, where America basically became, by default, kind of a single party system for about 20 years. But that was just because things were going well and there was nothing really to argue about. And of course, that is a gross oversimplification. Um, but that emerged naturally, not by force. Whereas during uh, contentious times, whether there are external threats, internal threats, or social upheaval, you should expect it to get a little bit nastier. But again, that is part of democracy working itself out by having those ongoing debates and having those uh, those ongoing dissenting opinions and airing those grievances and talking it out. Um, that is part of the process. That is that is that is a sign of things uh, progressing as as intended. So, with all that being said, what would an AI government look like? Because the thing is, when you're, when you're looking at all this, it's not a matter of machines just making decisions and enforcing it on us. That's a totalitarian regime, which we don't want. What we really want is we want the messiness of, of democracy that we have today. Because, you know, whenever I talk about universal AI values, it's like, well, who gets to decide them? And the answer is, and this is kind of why I was like, I was always confused by that retort. Um, but I understand it better is because we do, we get, we, the people get to decide what values we ultimately want to live by. Now there's, of course, there's always a contingent of people who want to enforce their particular values on everyone because they don't understand, uh, the history of democracy or why things are the way they are. Like for instance, whenever someone says America is a Christian nation and we all need to have more Christian law that is indistinguishable from Muslims who want to impose Sharia law on everyone else. So stop doing that. Um, the idea is freedom and equality are the highest principles that we have agreed on. And so then it's a matter of creating a container that allows for different uh, approaches to life. Now, some people do not tolerate uh, differences. They don't tolerate differences of religion or of opinion or values or beliefs. And those people are just wrong. That's not how democracy works. That's not how uh, inclusive, tolerant societies work. Um, so this thought experiment then is, okay, let's just assume that AI has the capacity to run the government. Let's, let's just imagine a year from now when we have AGI and it's, a, uh, and it's performing above human level on all benchmarks, it's in the 99.9th percentile um, or, or higher for like literally every cognitive ability. We've got, you know, advanced robots that can do stuff. And the ultimate goal is, what if we just removed humans from the government wholesale? Like, let's go full Monty, because this is this is what my Patreon supporter was like. Like, no, let's not beat around the bush. Let's just go full Monty and see what, like, what would this require? What were, what are the challenges, and how would it actually work? So let's dive into some of the uh, components that would make this happen. So the first thing that we need to do is use AI, whether it's a combination of existing, you know, machines and, and databases and stuff combined with large language models, combined with deep multimodal models. Um, we need to survey the will of the people. Whatever else is true, the per- one of the chief purposes of government is to reflect the will of the people. Now, right now, the primary way we have to do that is through voting. That is the primary mechanism that we have to express our will where it's, you know, every so often we get to go pick a person who, who we feel represents our desires and beliefs. And then we go and hire them via election to go represent our desires, our values, our beliefs in the process of government. But if you remove all humans, then it's not necessarily electing a representative. You have to express your will um, some other way. 
Now, that doesn't mean that you don't you get rid of voting. Maybe you have more voting. But this goes back to Socrates' complaint, which, uh, and I know Elon Musk is one of the people who said, oh, direct democracy makes sense. It absolutely doesn't. You do not want to live in a direct democracy because then you have tyranny of the majority um, and that can get real bad real fast. Um, however, by combining uh, you know, existing online platforms, leveraging new technologies, using large language models and semantic clustering and all sorts of stuff, I suspect that we could easily build a platform, a democratic platform, that very, very uh, comprehensively collects and understands the will of the people. Um, and then what do you do with that information? We can figure that out later. But rather than just picking a person, because re also remember, go back to the slide that I did about fundamental human flaws, power-seeking, avarice, uh, plain old ignorance, um, you get rid of those if you get rid of people. Now you introduce new problems if you replace people with machines. But the point is, is that if we can directly express our willpower through some mechanism, um, you know, maybe with a combination of blockchain voting and artificial intelligence and a few other things, then the, then the machine apparatus of government will at least be aware of what we, the people want. So that's step one. We need something that allows us to express our will and allows it to be recorded and accurately measured um, so that then the AI government can then use that. Another component of this is ongoing negotiation. So like I said, democracy is noisy by design. But if you get rid of individual you know, uh, politicians, then you don't have conventions, you don't have town halls. So then who are you talking to? Who do you write letters to? And this is, again, where the uh, collecting the will of the people is not just about, like, okay, the people have expressed their desire on this particular issue. Now the machine goes and does it. It is an ongoing conversation. It is an ongoing negotiation and renegotiation as the situation changes, as our understanding changes, as consensus changes, and so on and so forth. And so part of the, of the government, uh, what it does today is you know the 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 White House has their you know their press corps and politicians have their public relations managers. So we basically need the same thing, but with various AI components, kind of saying this is what we're doing and this is why and you know, like here's a here's a chance for feedback. We need to disseminate ideas, resources, and that sort of stuff. Oh, and one thing that I should point out is that I'm not necessarily thinking that one monolithic AI is the right way to go because the. From a narrative perspective, that's easier to say, like, you know, the AI. But really, I think that um, if we were to replace government with AI, it should be probably millions of individual AI agents all working together that are individually transparent, um, hence the swarms that we've been working on. Um, anyways, so getting back to the slide, uh, you know, there needs to be constant feedback uh, between, uh, you know, the people and the AI government. And as well as, you know, I mentioned consensus, but it's basically debate, uh, discussion, negotiation, dialogue, consensus. Those are all kind of the same thing. But it, the, the, the key takeaway is that it needs to be a two-way conversation. It's not just a unilateral, the will of the people gets expressed, and then the AI government goes and does that. That's not exactly the way that it works, and that's, not, that's, by, that's by design. That's not how representative democracy works. It's we express our will, and then the professional politicians, ideally, go and do their best to accom uh, accommodate that. But of course, you know, our politician goes to battle with other politicians and so on and so forth. Likewise, you know, we the people express our will to an AI government, and it will do the best that it can to implement that willpower within the constraints, within the boundaries of um, the way that other people, you know, want things to go, as well as other higher universal principles, such as enshrining, you know, equality and freedom above all else, above, you know, you know as an example, above a religious theocracy. Another thing that it's going to need is uh, mechanisms for change. So uh, it, as Western liberal democracies work today, incrementalism is the name of the game. You can make changes to literally every aspect of the government piece by piece, starting with the Constitution, and there are mechanisms there that allow for that change, which is why I gave this like little transformer dude, because you know it's like it looks like a modular robot or whatever. So that's it's supposed to be an allegory. 
But when you have an AI government, you don't want it to be rigid. You don't want it to be like, okay, once you implement it once, it's that way forever. No, you literally want every piece of the stack uh, to be changeable, to be plastic. And so that means all the models that the agents use, the hardware, the software, and that's just the system itself. Then all the policies that the system uses, the technology stack that it uses, the principles that it abides by. So, you know, if you've watched my channel, you know that I'm a big fan of like Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I'm also a big fan of, uh, of the heuristic imperatives that I created, but those need to be part of what is negotiated. That needs to be part of what is changeable. Now, obviously the core values, the core principles, you need to be really you know darn sure that you want to change those. Um, and it's also not necessarily something that you want d- direct d- democracy on because one, you might never get it passed, um, but you do want everyone to have a say in the process. So that's one thing that I think some people are not familiar with when looking at government systems. And it's not necessarily a vote on the outcome. It's, it's participating in the process of decision-making. Um, but all that aside, uh, this AI government system will need ways of changing, of modifying, of changing the stack, of changing uh, everything about it. So there's a couple parts of this because while you want it to be able to change, you don't want it to change too quickly. I guess long story short is this is probably one of the hardest parts is kind of what I'm getting at is creating a system that is modifiable, but that is not overly modifiable and that will adapt at the correct pace. And who knows, maybe that's the kind of policy that AI would be optimized to discover. That would be an interesting conversation to have. Another thing is that the scope of this AI government needs to expand and contract. And so what I mean by that is when America was founded, it was a very small government and it has gotten progressively bigger and bigger and bigger over time. One of the kind of Uh, turns of phrase that was used about a century ago was that the presidency was like a glove that stretched um, around the hand that wore it and it would never contract afterwards. And so, you know, you've probably heard debates about executive overreach or presidential overreach. Pretty much every president has expanded the office of presidency and it has never really contracted. Uh, Likewise, the U S government and many other governments have generally gotten bigger over time and we're, we're all very happy when it's like, oh, you know, like Obama shut down a dozen agencies or merged a few other ones. And it's like, yay, the government got smaller technically. Um, but the role of government has generally expanded with the one uh, exception being uh, legislating morality, which is one of the th- one of the places where Western governments have generally ceded that territory back to the people entirely. But part of an, uh, an idealized AI government is that if the people decide this is not the role of government and vote it out, the, 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 the robots will say, okay, we cede this territory. This is now up to you. Um, it, it's up to you to manage this. Um, so like, here's another example was embedded liberalism. The transition from there to neoliberalism was basically the free market, right? Everyone's familiar with the principles, the kind of our love affair with the free market. So that's a, that's a second example of the government kind of ceding territory and rather, Rather than providing a lot of services directly, it says, well, we'll let the free market provide those services and needs. Um, now, if we make a similar decision in the future, let's say, for instance, we want the you know, government to take its paws off of uh, roads, just as an example. Say, actually, we'll manage that from now on. Who knows? Maybe there will be technological solutions in the future that allow we, the people, to manage our own roads without any oversight from the government. I doubt it. Um, but just as an example, we do need mechanisms for an AI government to both expand and contract, um, as it makes sense. Um, and, and not just on its own accord, but also as a reflection of the will of the people and not just blindly following the will of the people, but making good decisions about what ground to seed, uh, versus what not to seed. And so I need to pause and talk about how, whenever you create an entity, Um, It basically kind of wants to grow. And this is true of every department and every company. This is true of every company. This is true of every politician, every government agency, is they all just kind of want to be bigger. Everything wants to be bigger. And the way that it's kind of characterized is like, it's like cancer. The more you feed it, the bigger it grows. And so you eventually, some things, you just kind of have to starve. But 
in an AI government, if you actually have one of the policies that it's constantly trying to tune, is it could be having part of that ongoing d- debate or negotiation is how big should this entity be? And what I mean by big is how, how big should its scope be? How big should its role be? How much influence should it have? How much power should it have? Um, now, you might say, well, no robot, no machine is ever going to deliberately make the choice to cede power. I don't necessarily agree with that because, like, you know, you can go on to uh, have have a discussion with, like, ChatGPT or, uh, you know, Bard or whatever today, and it will have a very nuanced opinion about the appropriate size and role of government. Um, and because it's dispassionate, because it does not have uh, the human flaws of greed and power-seeking, I actually think that the machines, if it made sense and it was the will of the people, that they would cede territory, that they would cede control um, if it made sense to. The next part is rights and justice. And I think this is this is actually what people are most concerned about when we talk about AI government is because the last thing that people want is to lose rights or they want uh, the last thing that they want is to um, end up in a more unjust world. And so you would need part of this government system to not just understand human rights. Um, and, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, we need to all agree on human rights before we can proceed, which is not true. You, you can come up with a, an imperfect solution and implement it before it is perfect because it will never be perfect. The demand for a perfect definition before proceeding is a thought stopping rhetorical thing. So, like, I don't really respect that opinion anymore. Um, especially when you say like, well, we already have actually a lot of established examples about what rights we do value versus the ones that we don't. Um, but what we need then is an AI system that can take the reins and say, okay, I will ensure that the the, the positive and negative rights that you have already agreed upon are um, dispassionately enforced and protected and that they're protected um, and upheld in the way that you intend and then part of that ongoing negotiation is, okay, once, once an AI government can run, you know, can protect the rights and justice of everyone and uh, you know, get rid of human biases, overcome machine biases, and those sorts of things, it will need to be able to, t- to detect its own bias as well, by the way. Um, but once you get to that point, then also those other mechanisms, those consensus mechanisms, those democratic feedback mechanisms. That's where the negotiation can can happen about, hey, what rights should be added or removed or modified or whatever. Because like when you talk to some people, like, it's really interesting some of the some of the debates that I've had where someone's like, well, I want the right to live in the country that I want. And so then they get upset because they're not able to unilaterally enforce their will on the entire country and they don't understand why that's a bad thing. Um, or, or why it doesn't work that way. So anyways, part of that dialogue is something that an AI government could have directly. Cause imagine if you can talk directly to like every AI agent that is responsible for running the country and it can explain to you why things are the way that they are. I think that there would be a lot of people who are a lot happier because also here's one thing that I, that I, uh, that I kind of perceive when I talk to people about politics. And that is that I think that, I think that a lot of people just don't understand why things are the way that they are and why that they're better than they think. And they're also trying to project some of their own problems and make it the responsibility of the government when it was never the responsibility of the government. And the, and that's part of the problem. And what they actually need to do is recognize that the government creates the environment for them to solve their own problems. And that's kind of what we've decided collectively is rather than have the government solve all of your problems for you, um, that it creates a healthy environment. Now, obviously, I recognize that it absolutely does not work for everyone. Um, you could even argue that it doesn't work for most people, which is why people are upset right now. Anyways, it's a very nuanced and, and, and difficult thing. But what I'm talking about here is um, these are some of the problems that will need to be uh, meted out uh, or not, not. That's not necessarily the right turn of phrase, but will need to be worked out um, in creating an AI based government. And then finally, I think one of the hardest things is just going to be um, gaining citizen buy-in, building trust over time. So all of these, this AI government, it's going to need to be transparent. It's going to need to be explainable, which means that any decision that it makes that affects us, we need to be able to understand it. And this is going to be really difficult to balance against a need for privacy and security. 
Because again, you know, if there's a if there's a hostile foreign power, if we're too transparent, it could game our own system against us. Those sorts of things. So it'll need to be resilient against manipulation. We will need to scale up to this if we do get to this point, because we're not going to just rip out the you know the venerated you know United States Congress and replace it with AI next year. Even if we do have AGI next year, we will need to work up to this over time through smaller demonstrations. We'll need to make sure that people are engaged, um, because if we do some experiments and people say actually we prefer humans. I don't think that it would go that way, especially in the long run. I think that it is, in the long run, I do think it is inevitable that AI will be at least running uh, most of government, if not all of it. But if people are not engaged with that idea, then it doesn't matter because it's not going to happen. Um, and then, of course, we'll need to make sure that it is uh, demonstrated to be reliable over the course of decades, if not centuries. Um, just by vert, I mean, that's just, that's just good sense to make sure that uh, you're not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And then um, another part is even once you have consensus, even like let's let's imagine that everything that I outlined works. We have technological mechanisms for getting the will of the people, for um, collecting consensus, for building consensus around rights and justice and equality and equity and justice and and fairness and freedom and all that stuff, which that alone is a monumental task. Even just getting to that part is hard enough. And then taking that, and implementing it is the next phase, which is why I made this graphic where it's just like, it's just this monumental problem that's, that would still be before us. Now, even if all that happens and, and we have machines, if we have, uh, cause remember part of this thought experiment is that we have AGI that is superhuman in capability, which you might say that's actually ASI and fine, whatever. Um, but imagine that we have machines that are more intelligent than all humans combined, so on and so forth. If anyone could figure it out, it could be them. But one of the problems there is the, deci- the if they take our will and then they come up with decisions and mechanisms and policies that we don't understand, then we're not necessarily going to believe it. And so this is why I think that that coming to human consensus is one thing, but then the machine execution is a whole other that's a whole other ball game. That's a whole other can of worms that is going to be um that's why I said like we're going to have to build up trust over time is because if we have these machines that have, you know, an IQ of 3000 and they can think abstract thoughts across time and space and multidimensional blah, 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 right? Things that just like even the smartest humans would take centuries to understand if ever, maybe never could understand. It will require a tremendous amount of trust to be able to handle the rain, to hand the reins over in such a way, which is why I actually suspect that we will probably want some humans involved in government maybe forever. I don't know. There might, there might be a time in the future where uh, it's just proven that humans are um, just fundamentally flawed and either too greedy or too stupid to participate in a government. And I mean like centuries from now, this is way too far in the future to really predict. But the, my point is, is that coming to consensus is one thing and then executing on that is an entirely other thing. Okay, so the last part of the video. What are the actual predictions that I have starting today? Where are we going to go from here? So the first thing is that we already have AI driving efficiency in government and in government vendors. So I've talked to a few people um, you know, that are connected to me on LinkedIn. They're building tools and services that um, help the government run better. And so the first thing that we're seeing is just adm- administrative automation just running paperwork and doing paperwork better and faster and making sure that it actually gets done on time. That, that has to do with cost efficiency because rather than hiring, you know, 50 employees, you just have an AI firm do it for you. Um, It increases the effectiveness of the service. It increases the throughput of the government services. And so like, this is kind of the first step in building trust that AI can at least do the mundane nitty gritty of running government. Um, It's not making decisions right now. It's just processing paperwork. Uh, And so this is the very first step in incremental adoption of AI. So uh, baseline automation, great. Now you might say, well, but what if when you can do that, it just, they throw more at it, Um, you know, because that's that's what's called the lump of labor fallacy, which the idea is that there's a finite amount of work to be done. And then once you automate that away, then 
then it's done forever. But that's not how it works, actually. Usually when you have the capacity to do more work, you find more work to do because there was latent unmet demand. But with the, with the progress that AI is making, I would not necessarily make the assumption that there is an infinite amount of government work to do. And in fact, I can predict that some people would say you actually wouldn't want the government to have an infinite amount of work to do. You actually want to get to the point where literally everything that, the, that, the, that we, the people, want the government to do is done, and then it can like you know take a break or whatever. Um, but right now, because of the scarcity of, of cognitive labor, we can never get to that point. So AI will hopefully drive the government to be more efficient, to catch up on all the paperwork, and start to shrink in terms of human headcount. So this is happening... It's it, it's not fully happening today. It's starting to happen today, where there are people that are serving government um, in terms of either contractors or implementing systems inside the government. Obviously, the adoption is very slow and, and methodical. Um, but ChatGPT is out there, and we know that people in the government are using ChatGPT at the very least. The next thing is, and this might already be happening, but we don't really know because no politician is going to admit it. But it's entirely possible that they're using stuff like ChatGPT to draft and read legislation. Um, basically, this means that uh, you know you can write longer bills, which is not necessarily a good thing, because we don't necessarily want 5,000-page uh, bills being introduced every single day, especially if they're being written by AI and then read by AI and humans are out of the loop. Eventually, that might be the case, but we, we need to build up to that and trust it. But it is eminently possible because, you know, if you've watched my channel like earlier this year and last year, what I would do is I would take like new pieces of legislation or, or whatever and just feed it to GPT. And if I'm doing that, you know that the politicians are too. Uh, and so this can accelerate the negotiation and revision of legislation. Whether or not that's a good thing is uh, remains to be seen. But what it can also do is it can empower us to say, oh, hey, Send, your out, send out your personal agent to go read the bills that are being proposed or the bills that have been passed. And you can say, hey, actually, I have more information. And this also goes back to Socrates, which is an informed and educated and empowered electorate is actually required to have a functioning, healthy democracy. And so even if some of the aspects of AI participating in the drafting and revision of legislation are problematic, the fact that AI can read it infinitely faster than humans and we can say, like, okay, which parts do I agree with? Which parts do I disagree with? Um, what are the flaws? What are the general principles uh, here? What are the what? Are, where does it violate principles? Um, this again, it has to do with streamlining the process of of government of passing legislation um, and and debating it. Again, remember, democracy is noisy by design, and so part of that is the debate. Part of that is the negotiation. And this is something that if it's not happening today, which I'm pretty sure it is. It is eminently possible and should be, and I'm not saying should is a value statement, but I mean should be happening soon just as a matter of prediction. And then the next phase, this is not happening yet, but this would be another major milestone, which is the integration of, of AI into justice. And of course, um, when you look at like preventative policing things, it's like, ooh, this could go real bad because if if AI is trained on racist data, guess what? It becomes racist AI. So there's a lot that we need to do. However, when you look at the administrative aspect where it's just processing paperwork, this is the kind of thing where civil attorneys, criminal defense attorneys, uh, prosecutors, judges, they're all probably going to be using AI. Um, and if not, if not now, then soon. And so then these, these AI tools, these AI systems that are going to be integrated into the Justice Department, um, that will probably expand over time because if they find that it makes their job um, easier, if it makes their job better, if the outcomes are more fair, um, obviously there are probably no regulations around this right now. And I can imagine that there are plenty of people in government, in law that are like, they're purists that are, that are like, no, um, like we will never use this, but like, the fact of the matter is, is I know several, plenty of lawyers who use AI on a regular basis. So if lawyers are using it, then judges are probably using it. Then DAs are probably using it. Everyone's going to be using it. So um, then it's a matter of making sure that these systems are safe and robust and that the, and that justice is meted out fairly um, and, and it becomes increasingly fair over time, that it becomes increasingly equitable over time and reflects the actual values and principles that we have. Um, 
But part of this transition would be moving away from human biases, overcoming human biases. Because what if you could have like another layer in the Justice Department that looks at all the decisions that a judge makes and says, actually, that's kind of a racist decision, or actually, that's kind of a sexist decision. Maybe we need to, you know, review that. Um, I think it would be great if Justice Departments had internal review boards um, that were augmented by AI. Why? Because then I think that um, activist judges could probably be reined in. Um, you could also think like, what if AI was was surveilling judges who write warrants? Because you always hear horror stories of judges who will write warrants for everything, and then you know homes get swatted and babies get hit with flashbang grenades. That's actually a thing that happens here in America. So yeah, like I think that I think that there is an opportunity for AI to make the Justice Department more fair. Now, obviously, the the flip side of that is pointing AI and creating a surveillance state that uses AI to police us. But you know, this is the question of who watches the watchers. I think that AI should watch them more than it watches us. I th- that's the, that's the surveillance state that I want to see, where the AI holds government accountable, all offices of government more accountable. And that's kind of what I'm talking about here. And the next is the executive branch. So here's Joe Biden going going bonkers with uh, with some uh, AI written legislation. Um, which, oh, by the way, I'm pretty sure that the that the longest executive order that has ever been written was written in part with AI, because and it was about AI. Go figure. Um, anyways, again, because I know I have talked to people in the diplomatic corps in the State Department who are using AI, it's already happening. So this is not really a prediction, but my anticipation is that that usage is going to expand over time and that more and more aspects of the government will be eminently automatable and that uh, we might switch to more of human oversight or human uh, steering and these AI, you know, AI, whether it's AI tools that are passive or AI agents that are semi-autonomous or fully autonomous will be responding to the will of humans, you know, the, the, the electorate that we empower. And who knows, maybe a hybrid system is what we're going for where you know the politicians that we elect then go use AI to do all the debates and it makes them more effective. I don't know. Like I said, I kind of anticipate that eventually humans are going to be the main bottleneck and that eventually we're just going to want humans out of government. But that decision should be our decision, uh, the people's decision, not the AI's decision and not the politician's decision. Um, anyways, uh, but basically then kind of the, the one potential final form is that the humans are basically just kind of caretakers. That the humans that we elect, you know, we might still have a president, you know, you know, a million years from now, probably not. Um, but if we did, then the president, is, like their primary job is going to be to implement, you know, the, the will of the people by way of the machines. I don't know. We'll see how it turns out. So very finally, here's some of the milestones that I kind of anticipate and would be on the lookout for. So first, adoption in government. Like I said, there's plenty of evidence that it's already happening. And this is year year zero, right? Like ChatGPT came out just over a year ago, so we're about we're 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 technically just started year one of AI. The more that AI participates in doc in in, in the democratic process, the more we will be transitioning naturally towards an AI government. Again, we're already there. We're already in the process of transitioning to an AI run government. It's just happening behind the scenes. It's not happening transparent, transparently, but it's happening organically. It is naturally emerging just because AI is a new set of tools. And, well, humans are humans, and they're going to use tools to make their lives easier. So that is all happening. That And it's just a matter of degrees, like I said at the beginning of the video. A lot of this is a matter of scope and degrees and, uh, and an organic process over time. The, so the, the very first major milestone will be any offices that are either shuttered, like where, where a human officer is no longer needed because the need for them is just replaced by an AI platform. Or um, even more where like a, a human officer just might be replaced by a collection of AI agents. Um, that is going to be one of the most pivotal milestones that we see. And there's probably going to be several ways that this expresses. So it, it remains to be seen how that will happen, but you can imagine quite a few ways that it's like, oh, hey, you know, maybe the FDA gets replaced by AI. That, that's what I mean. Like, what if you shut down the entire FDA and replace it with an AI version? Like, that's the kind of thing that I would be looking for is 
what is the first office or department that gets either completely reconfigured or reimagined or shut down due to AI? The next one is consensus mechanisms. So obviously we pretty much only have voting right now. Um, so as AI becomes integrated into those democratic dialogues, into those consensus, into that polling mechanism, that is going to be another major milestone. And I think that that's more eminently possible because just collecting sentiment, like, you know, Pew Research polls, right? Like they're not, a, they're not part of the government, but they are responsible for collecting sentiment. Um, and so what if like they create an AI platform that is better at detecting uh, sentiment and then, you know, government employees and government departments use that as part of their process. And so then the, the very final major milestone, again, because this is, this is a, a matter of human decision, is once the people, once the voters' sentiment change, and once we say, actually, we're really on board with the idea of getting rid of politicians or shutting down parts of the government and replacing it with AI, that's going to be the major tipping point. That's the major milestone. Because once the will of the people is that strong, I'm not going to say it's inevitable because obviously we should expect politicians to probably fight to maintain the status quo because that's what they do. Um, but that's also part of their job is to resist uh, change. Um, but again, if we get to the point where it's like we rewrite the Constitution to allow for machines to participate in government, like that would be really cool. So thanks for watching. I hope you got a lot out of this. Thanks to Spectral Valkyrie for suggesting the video topic. Um, have a good one, everyone.